The Halloween decorations are up. I'm wearing a sweater and a jacket, and I'm mainlining pumpkin spice. I'm reading and watching all the spook I can get my hands on, currently Cold People by Tom Rob Smith, and The Curious Creations of Christine McConnell on Netflix. And I thought it would be fun to tell a more in-depth spooky tale this October. I'm in the mood to change perspectives, and I've been hinting that Biddy had stories to tell. Lucky for us, she's finally ready to share one. To be clear, this is not the story of Biddy. It's just one of the incredibly, unbelievably creepy stories she has from her life. And so we're going to watch it unfold from her perspective. Of course, I'm in there too. God forbid I tell anything that doesn't include me. I plan to share Biddy's story several chapters at a time, just like I did for Lilith, releasing new episodes every Friday this October. At least I think that's how it'll go. You never know around here. Let's begin. We shouldn't be talking about this. A Ghost in the Burb Story by Liz Sauer. Narrated by the author. Biddy lay in bed scrolling through her Instagram feed, her dog Frank beside her. It was a Saturday morning and she was determined to do nothing of value, except weed the side yard and pick up black paint for the interior of the fireplace and bring the dog's old carrier and a pile of books to the dump swap. She'd left her job six months prior and when she wasn't documenting evidence of the demonic, she filled her days with home improvements, shopping, and keeping a closer eye on her 15-year-old daughter, Alice. The house was silent, save for Frank's gentle breathing. Alice was still asleep, Biddy's husband, Andrew, out for his morning run. Biddy probably wouldn't have heard the knocking were it not for the quiet. Three gentle taps. It took a moment for her to register the rapping. At first, she wasn't even sure what she'd heard, if she'd heard anything at all. Frank didn't stir. Then again, he was losing his hearing. The silence persisted. She looked back down at her phone and switched over to her email app. Advertisements and an invitation to a fundraiser. She was about to switch over to the Weather Channel app, her very favorite, when a message caught her attention. Actually, it was the sender's name that stopped her. She hadn't heard from him in some time. Father McGonagall. She opened the email and as she scanned the text, three raps, this time not so soft, broke the silence. She sat up, disturbing Frank. Where did that come from? Maybe Alice is awake, she thought, but didn't really believe. She got out of bed and slid into her bathrobe. Frank just watched her sleepily. Poking her head into the hallway, she saw that her daughter's door was still closed. Knock, knock, knock. That was definitely coming from downstairs. It had to be Andrew. So then, why was she so on edge? And that email, it had to be a coincidence. She checked to see that Alice's door was still closed before tiptoeing down the stairs as quietly as possible. Frank, having decided to join her, ruined it by clomping down the hall and charging ahead. All was still on the first floor. Andrew wasn't back yet. Frank went to the back door, asking to be let out. She hesitated for a moment, unsure whether she should allow him to go out before she knew what was making that weird knocking sound. But Frank wasn't willing to wait. She slid the door open and watched him cross the yard, nose down, tail wagging softly. Knock, knock, knock. Her chest tightened. It's the basement door. Her eyes moved to the sliding lock at the top of the door. As quickly as she could, she moved forward and slammed the bolt into place. Nothing happened. Silence again settled over her home. Without turning her back on the basement door, she peeked out the slider to the backyard and saw Frank rolling in the grass happily, which most likely meant he'd found bunny poop. She went through a mental checklist of protection she'd put in place around her home and property. St. Benedict medals at the four corners, a line of salt poured across all thresholds, a frankincense-infused candle burned thoroughly at the most central point of the home on the first of each month. It had worked for so long, but now she feared it wasn't. She'd have to make some calls. Whoever you are, she said in a low voice, you are not welcome here, and I command that you leave my home. The statement was met with silence. She shook her hands out at her sides as if to shake off the bad feeling, then went to the Keurig. A cup of hot coffee would fight off the chill. The cup had just finished brewing when she heard the garage door that led to the mudroom open and shut. 
Relieved, she added cream to the cup and went to the slider to let Frank inside. He sat down, waiting for his breakfast. Daddy's home, she enthused, surprised the dog hadn't run to greet Andrew. Frank blinked. Frank, go get Daddy, she insisted, an edge in her voice. When the dog didn't move, she forced herself through the kitchen and family room. Andrew? Frank followed, and when they turned the corner, they found the mudroom empty. Andrew! she yelled. Maybe he'd gone back out to the garage. No, the deadbolt was in place. Come to think of it, she hadn't heard the burglar alarm signature beep when she thought she'd heard the door open. She was headed down the front hall to the stairs to check on Alice when the front door opened. She spun around, ready to bolt, when her husband stepped inside. Good morning, he said happily. His face changed as he took her in. What's wrong? A family in Sherborne needs urgent attention. Biddy reread the email one final time before replying. It was Monday morning, and she was nursing her third cup of coffee under the shade of their patio umbrella. There was a chill in the air. It was too late in the season for most people to worry about the sun, but her fair, freckled skin didn't care what season it was. She could burn in the dead of winter. There hadn't been any further knocking in the house, but the point had been made. Whatever was doing it had gotten her attention, and she felt it in her bones that it was the content of the email that carried it into her home. May I bring a sensitive with me to the initial interview? She'd asked in her email response. If you deem it absolutely necessary, came the priest's reply. Her thoughts drifted to Poe, the shadow figure who'd trailed her for years before she gave up chasing ghosts. She hadn't thought of him in a long time, and yet he'd been on her mind since she'd first read that email, since that inexplicable knocking in her home, and that wasn't a good sign. Thoughts of shadow figures were never a good sign, save her to focus on the demonic. There were rules where the demonic was concerned, a playbook of sorts. Unlike other beings that crept in the darkness, demons existed within strict boundaries and could be banished, cast back into that darkness as long as their host was willing until they fought their way out again. Biddy would never claim to be a psychic or sensitive, but the hundreds of hours she'd spent investigating haunted places in the past honed her ability to recognize a certain brand of trouble. She knew when a specific brand of darkness had snaked its way into a home, and she knew the Catholic Church had a time-tested way to combat that darkness. The darkness within the church itself was another matter. She'd left her faith in the institution itself behind, but Good people existed within the corrupt structure, and she still believed in their ability to cast out demons. Unwilling to put her family in danger by attracting otherworldly creatures to their home, she used the knowledge she'd accrued in her career as a paranormal investigator to help people in the safest way she knew possible. She interviewed those who believed they were being haunted by demons, documented their stories, and provided proof, when appropriate, that the Catholic Church's help was necessary to free them from infestation, oppression, or in the very worst cases, possession. Most often she encountered a family in the midst of a regular old haunting or some other paranormal situation involving non-demonic entities, and she called on her vast network of para-people to help them. She didn't go looking for ghosts and she didn't spend her time seeking out the supernatural anymore. She simply documented demonic proof and handed it over to the church, or when demons weren't the problem, she connected people who needed help with the most appropriate resources. She kept her real life, her family life, separate. She'd left ghost hunting behind when Alice was young, but she couldn't deny the pull it still had on her, especially now that she wasn't working. It had been a long summer getting Alice back on track after a spring of high anxiety and depression. But now that her daughter was back at school, under the careful watch of her teachers, the days stretched out, and as she ticked more and more home improvement projects off the list, Biddy found herself taking on more cases for the church. The Biddy who used to dive headlong into the darkness didn't exist anymore. She'd learned to be careful, but she knew there was no way to be too careful as long as she kept even one toe in the game. And now there was unexplained knocking in her home. Current scones, Liz whispered dramatically. Biddy pointed to the display case. I'm getting a croissant. Oh, I forgot about those. 
What can I get you? A woman behind the counter asked. Two raspberry croissants and a small currant scone, Liz replied, before glancing over at Betty. My treat. Pastries and coffees in hand, they crossed the street to a nearby park and sat at a picnic table beneath a tall clock tower. A group of middle school aged boys played soccer on the field while preschoolers drew messy pictures on pavers meant to provide an endless spiral walkway for meditation. Lay it on me, Liz said before taking a bite of croissant. There's a family in Sherborne. Their adult daughter reached out to the church because she's worried about her parents. Why? Mom and dad won't move out of the haunted house and the woman is certain there is demonic involvement. Hard pass, Betty snorted. Do you know how many of these interviews I do that end up being nothing or just a simple haunting? Liz eyed her. I'm sure it's nothing, but I want your opinion. Well, what I really want is Claire's opinion. Fair enough. Why in this case, though? There's just something about the email. I don't know what it is exactly, but if you picked up on anything, or even better, if you actually heard something, then... And by something, you mean a demon. Betty shrugged. Just as Liz went to take a sip of her coffee, a rogue soccer ball flew towards them, hitting her square in the back. Coffee sloshed out onto the picnic table, and Biddy scooted out of the way before it leaked through onto her lap. A chorus of boys' voices rang out. Oh, man! Dude, sorry! It's fine, Liz called back tightly as one of the kids came to apologize and retrieve the soccer ball. When Biddy was able to control her laughter, she said, It truly is a gift. What is? You're just a magnet for awkward situations. Liz just shook her head in response and slid down the bench seat away from the spill. I'm talking to the kids tomorrow at 10, Betty continued, realizing she was more concerned about talking to them than she'd allowed herself to acknowledge. We're meeting at the Starbucks on... Three raps on the underside of the picnic table interrupted her. What the hell? Was that a squirrel? Liz ducked down to look at the underside of the table. Biddy didn't answer. Liz watched her for a moment. What aren't you telling me? I heard that same knocking at the house. Pipes, loose siding, Frank, Liz trailed off. No, I think it knows I'm coming and it's trying to scare me off. Liz began picking at a hangnail. Did you hear something just now? Liz's hand dropped to her lap. She sighed and pushed herself up from the table. It's a collector. That's what Claire said. It's a collector. Be careful. What the hell does that mean? Liz just shrugged. Tell me about the house. They sat around a large high-top table at the Starbucks on Central Street. The siblings both began to speak at once. Devlin, a slender, pale man who reminded Biddy of an old college boyfriend who never washed his jeans and was prone to unexpected bursts of rage, pressed his lips together and looked at the ceiling. His sister Mallory quickly apologized. Sorry, sorry, you go, she insisted. A few years older than her brother, she had the same fine blonde hair. She too was slender, but with a healthy softness about her, whereas her brother appeared jagged. Devlin offered his sister a tight smile, then continued. The house was built in 1695. The original portion is a salt box colonial, and the addition, which was added in the 80s, is a Cape Cod-style garage with a primary bedroom and bathroom above it. The two sections are connected by a mudroom on the first floor and a long, narrow hallway on the second floor. I always called that the Hall of Doors, said Mallory. It's lined with closets. Did your family build the addition? asked Betty, wondering if perhaps they'd inadvertently stirred up activity by altering the home. No, the people who lived there before us did it, Devlin answered. Betty looked up from her notebook. Do you happen to know the name of the family who lived there before you? The siblings exchanged a look. Uh, McCormick or maybe McConaughey, something like that? Our mom will know, Mallory said. I'm so sorry I'm late. One of the goddamn dogs got out. He's dead set on poking around the woods behind our house, and it's a fucking miracle I even found him. Jesus, weather is making up for that summer drought. Will it rain ever? Liz was shaking out her rain jacket, but stopped talking abruptly, 
noting the look on Betty's face. She slid into a seat. Sorry. Hi, I'm Liz. Mallory and Devlin Byrne introduced themselves. As he shook her hand, Devlin said, So, you're a psychic? Liz glanced over at Biddy, unable to hide her annoyance. No, no, I can't predict the future or anything, but I can talk to ghosts. I mean, I can see them too, so I basically have a conversation with them if they want to talk to me. She blew out a breath, obviously anxious. Yeah, so... Biddy asked me to come in case I connect with any spirits or offer any help. Are there any spirits around us now? Asked Mallory. Liz smiled and shook her head. Biddy could tell she was holding something back, that she had heard or seen something that was either too personal or too frightening to share in front of Mallory and Devlin. I ordered a coffee on the app, Liz said in an obvious attempt to change the subject. I'll just pop over when they call my name. I apologize again for being late. What did I miss? We were just talking about their home. The house they grew up in is over 300 years old, Biddy replied. What was the property like? The house is on a pretty busy road in town, but the actual property is gorgeous. It sits on nine acres, explained Devlin. There's a huge lavender meadow past the backyard, and beyond that are the woods, his sister added and the graveyard. Right, Mallory continued. We found old gravestones when we were little. Yikes, Liz breathed. In the meadow? No, back in the woods. Really, the markers were super, super old. Biddy made a note to search the town records for documentation at the burial grounds. Sounds like an amazing place to grow up. Aside from the dead bodies buried in the woods, Liz muttered, earning smiles from the brother and sister. Excuse me for a second. She retrieved her coffee from the counter quickly and returned to the table. Exploring those woods was an escape from the house for a little while, Mallory explained. But then... The woods ended up being just as creepy as the house, her brother finished. How so? asked Betty. I was in the backyard reading one afternoon, not long after we'd moved in, and I looked up and there was this huge man-shaped shadow standing just at the edge of the woods, Mallory explained. I watched it for a few seconds before it got, like, sucked back into the trees. Was that the only time you saw this shadow man? asked Biddy, an edge in her voice, causing Liz to glance over at her. I saw it on the other side of the stone wall a few times, Mallory admitted. Did you ever see it? Liz asked, directing the question to Devlin. Yeah, it was the only thing that I did see, actually. The house was creepy and all, but I honestly think that's just because it was so old. But I do remember that shadow man in the woods. Our imaginations probably went a little wild after seeing it. Mallory looked at him and opened her mouth to protest, but then seemed to change her mind, pursing her lips. Did the shadow man stay at the edge of your yard? Biddy asked. No, Mallory said, as her brother said, yes. Mallory turned to face him. You really don't remember? It was everywhere, always watching us. Come on now, the house was wicked old and mom and dad basically did nothing to fix it up. Sure, maybe we saw things that we couldn't explain, but I think we might have gotten a little carried away. Devlin, Mallory snapped. What are you doing? You know what happened in that house. Honestly, he hesitated. Look, I didn't fully realize this until recently, but I barely remember anything from growing up. Anything? Biddy pressed. What about holidays or birthdays? What are you talking about? Mallory snapped. He looked down at the table. I've been talking to someone, you know, because of all my anxiety and stress and stuff, and I sort of realized that I only have like a couple real memories from our childhood. The rest is just kind of foggy, Devlin admitted. Biddy took a long moment to scribble something on her pad. And you don't have any trouble with your memory. Mallory hesitated, glancing at her brother before responding. I remember everything. Okay, then let's start from the beginning, Betty suggested. 
How old were you both when you moved in? And what was the first thing you remember seeing inside the house? I was 11 and Dev was nine. We moved from Brookline. From the bits and pieces I was able to overhear back then, we were having money problems. I think my dad might have lost his job, but I'm not sure. A farmhouse on nine acres doesn't sound cheap, Liz pointed out. Devlin shrugged. It was the late 90s and the place was nearly decrepit. Your parents didn't talk to you about why they made the move? Our parents keep their cards close to the chest, Devlin replied, sharing a look with his sister. The move was really hard, Mallory explained. It was the summer before middle school and I had a really hard time making friends. Our parents were really stressed out, so we tried to stay out of the way. That's why we spent a lot of time in the woods at first, before we got too scared to go out there. I do remember that, wandering around out there, building forts, making little patterns and stuff with the twigs until it was close to dark. Mallory smiled at him. It was fun for a while. And then you saw the shadow figure. That and other stuff. Mallory trailed off. Such as, Liz prompted, M mists. There were mists in the woods, especially in this one place where we'd build our forts. They sort of rose up around the trees. That was just fog, Mal, Devlin said softly. I thought you said you don't remember, she replied, obviously agitated. He sighed. He thinks, no, the whole family thinks that it was all just my overactive imagination, but it wasn't. Mom and Dad were totally checked out and we were left on our own to deal with everything. Every single night, those nightmares, and it was awful. Mallory looked close to tears, Devlin frustrated. What nightmares? asked Liz. Devlin's night terrors. They started a few weeks after we moved in. We'd always shared a room at our old house, but now that we were in that huge house, we were so psyched to each have our own room. Our bedrooms were next door to one another, but our mom and dad were down the long hallway that connected the new addition to the old part of the house. They had a whole suite above the garage, and there was a door that closed it off to the rest of the house. They always kept it closed, so they didn't always hear what was happening. And the house was so noisy, all the time really, but I think it was just more noticeable at night because there weren't any distractions. Um, Mallory seemed to lose her train of thought. Did you start seeing shadows around that same time? Liz asked, earning a look from Biddy. Yes, Mallory confirmed, looking surprised. I hated that house from the first night, but I didn't start seeing shadows until, well, yeah, until around the time Devlin started having those dreams. I made sure I never drank water a few hours before bedtime because they were in the hallway and, wait, she leaned forward. Why do you ask? Um, my guide brought them up, Liz hedged. Wow, okay. It's not that far of a stretch to think there might be shadows in a supposedly haunted house, Devlin pointed out. Did they walk past your room at night and like glide up the walls in that spooky green hallway? Did the lights flicker when they made their presence known? Liz asked without missing a beat. Yes, Mallory confirmed. All of that. The hallway was painted forest green. Liz nodded. Mm. And in the basement, right? They made it uninhabitable. Devlin nodded, obviously impressed. So what are they? I don't know yet, Liz admitted. But if I'm being told about them, they're significant. Biddy shifted in her seat. Noted. So you said the house was noisy. How so? Then knocks and footsteps were constant. We'd hear doors open and then footsteps down the hall, only to look and no one would be there. And thuds and bangs, three knocks, either low or loud, but the knocking was constant. Wait, what? Liz said suddenly, looking at Biddy. What, what? said Biddy. Liz shook her head. Sorry, I thought you, what did you hear? I thought you said it's not the coincidence you think it is. I didn't say anything. Was it Claire? 
Betty asked, referring to Liz's spirit guide. Liz shook her head. Uh-uh. The siblings watched them, wide-eyed. Biddy jotted a note, then said, Go on, to Mallory. Um, okay, so it was hard to fall asleep at night because just as you dozed off, you'd hear that tapping, or there'd be footsteps in the hall that would stop outside your door. It was scary. Did you experience the same thing? Biddy asked Devlin. He shrugged. Mallory drew in a breath. He doesn't remember. What about your parents? They blamed the noises on the house at first. Eventually, they acknowledged that something might be happening, but we were told to ignore it and pray. Mallory's voice was bitter. What about the night terrors? Mallory shifted in her seat and glanced at her brother. I had a really hard time falling asleep in that house, even before everything started up. We'd been in a townhouse before in a busy neighborhood, and I was used to hearing people next door or neighbors outside, but the house was different, creepy. The first time Dev had one of those bad dreams. I don't know how long I'd been asleep or what time it was, but his shrieking startled me awake so completely that I was out of my bed into the door before I even realized what was happening. I ran out into the hallway and saw that his door was wide open. I do remember that, Devlin cut in. My door never stayed closed, even when I locked it. Mallory nodded. You were standing on your bed with your back pressed against the wall, and you were screaming your lungs out. I couldn't see the corner of the room you were staring at, so I was afraid to go in. I just yelled your name and tried to get your attention. It felt like it took forever for our parents to get to us. They must have been sound asleep or couldn't hear because of that goddamn door, but finally Dad blew past me and pulled you down off the bed. You came right around, but you were confused. You said you had no idea what scared you. You didn't know why you were screaming. Devlin just shook his head. He wasn't dreaming, Liz said quietly. Mallory looked defensive. I watched it happen almost every night for nine years. If they weren't dreams, then what were they? They all watched Liz. She was looking down at the table, her head cocked slightly to the side. Finally, she gave a little nod, then looked back up. Meeting Devlin's eyes, she said, You were taken. Looks like I've put my foot in my mouth again, and have been offensive in a term that I've used over the past few years. A listener let me know that the term High Holy Days is used exclusively in the Jewish religion in reference to their most widely observed holidays, beginning with Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and ending 10 days later with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And my flippant use of the term High Holy Season, when referring to autumn, appropriates that phrase I apologize for any offense I may have caused, and I intend to stop saying it. I feel like a real jerk, and I am very sorry. Well, thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I am truly grateful. Check out ghostintheburbs.com for all the links, including merch. All proceeds through the end of the year will be donated to headinghomeinc.org. Good night, sleep tight, and don't forget your nightlight.